Alrighty, let's see what happens. Fill up my cup of coffee while you guys roll in here. <clears throat> also, I want to try something out with webcam number two today. Where is webcam number two? How is it that I can put things down and lose them forever? All right, here we go. Hello, everyone. Hi, Kelly. Hey, Shane, how are you? So I want to try something today. Don't know if it's going to work. Probably won't. Matter of fact, I need a tripod. But while we're waiting for everyone to get here, we can kind of chat for a couple of minutes. I really need an extension wire too. That was one of my limiting factors last week. So we'll see if this helps us. This may work, this may not. Do we have sound? Sound is good. Thank you very much for letting me know. Appreciate that. I always put you guys to work. As soon as you show up, I tell you what to do. <laughs> So last week I missed you guys. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I could not uh, get any kind of reception that was worth trying to even do like a, a simple live stream. It was just pointless. So instead, I thought I would see what happened. Okay, so that's working. <clears throat> so I have this idea I want to try out. But in the meantime, I don't want to waste your time. I want to get to the point of what's going on today. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is no pox. And I have been documenting what's happening with my tank, tanks, uh, because it's all the same system, to see what's going to happen. And uh, I'll eventually release a video that kind of goes into the entire topic and shows my reasonings, what I dosed, how long I waited, what kind of results I got. That's all coming. But for now, uh, it's uh, been three weeks and a day since I started dosing. And there's a white film on the inside of my aquarium every single day. Uh, if you look in the video, you can probably see this back wall is wider than the front wall because I cleaned the front. I haven't cleaned the back. And then the anemone cube, it's grown coralline and it's got some film on the glass and it actually needs a razor blade to get it clean. <clears throat> so we are going to hopefully get some camera on that today. I want to try something with the webcam and see if maybe it'll play nicely. I'm not sure yet. I'll hold this in place. I need to see what this thing sees. I don't want to show you guys until I'm ready. It's not horrible. Hmm, okay. Hmm. So if I could put a little piece of tape on top of this, that might do the job. Hey, it gives me a nice tan too. All right. One of the things that I've been encountering from a lot of people uh, that surprised me is that I always tend to think people know what the heck I'm, up, I'm doing. They, they seem to know exactly what I'm doing in my life. And <clears throat> so when I mention like I'm dosing no pox, I get all these questions like, so you have a nitrate problem? I'm thinking, how do you not know that I have a nitrate problem? I've only been talking about it for two years straight. So part of that video will obviously go into what I've used, why it got that high, why I care, and... Uh, Hopefully, how successful I was in resolving the problem. That is my ultimate goal. My coffee just finished. Um, let me tell you about Tulsa, Oklahoma really quick, and then we're going to jump into our topic. So Tulsa is about almost five hours away by car, and I drove up there on Friday, got there early Saturday morning, got a little bit of sleep, and then the show happened in the... Hard Rock Cafe and, uh, or Hard Rock Casino and Convention Center. And that was a kind of a surprising venue for a frag swap or a frag event. They called it the uh, Tornado Alley Reef Expo. And what I really liked about it was that we had a nice room and we had, you know, and uh, it was dark. <laughs> so everyone had their tanks glowing blue. I, I got this shirt while I was there, which is from. I can't remember here. I'll just let you guys look at the back. North American something something. <laughs> and uh, 
I like the shirt and I said to Justin, I want that shirt. And so he gave me one. I said, do you mind if I wear it on YouTube? <laughs> he was laughing. Oh, yes. Don't, don't show my company name on YouTube, whatever you do. So I thought that was pretty funny. I like this shirt. So what I'm hoping to do here is maybe give you a view of the anemone cube while we're talking today with an orange filter so it doesn't look like a mess. So I'm, I'm setting that up right now, hoping this will work. No guarantees. This might need more scotch tape too. See, I didn't want to put a lot of tape on there and then when I look at the tape, you see scotch tape on all four sides, you know? So we're gonna try a couple of tricks here. <sighs> Let's see. Yeah, that looks classy. Hey, it's working. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see, all right, it's not horrible. The tank is actually uh, significantly bluer than you're seeing right now. It's a little tilted too, how do I get this straight? I'm trying to get level. Do we care if it's level? Probably not. And I'll turn this other thing off the screen, sorry guys, I didn't mean to leave that there quite that long. Where is that intro thing? Turn this off. All right. Now, when I did this in the past and I was talking, I was picture in picture, but I don't see the picture in picture thing happening this time. So, I don't know. Um, do you prefer looking at the tank and listening to my voice? <laughs> or do you prefer seeing my face on your screen? Of course, I could do this from time to time. No, I'm joking. Um, let me fill up my cup of coffee really quick here. I want to talk about new tanks and what happens when you set them up because there's some frustrations that I see hobbyists dealing with on a regular basis and it concerns me. And I want your life to be easier, not harder. So today's topic is going to be about that specifically. Um, let me pull this up because this is kind of a serious topic. So let's, let's talk together as a, as a group. Um, when you guys set up a new tank with dry sand and dry rock because you're opposed to any kind of risk of pests, I understand why you're asking for that and I understand, uh, you know, the, the feeling. But the problem is the pendulum has swung too far toward pristine and pure to the point where people get upset if their sand starts to get dirty or if their, um, their glass gets some algae and they just want that perfection all the time and that is completely unnatural. How many of you have a perfect yard in front of your house where everything is just exactly right? Probably very few of you. And even if you have your own landscapers and you have a landscape architect that designed it beautifully, it still has to be maintained. It still grows out of control. It still has to be weeded. Uh, it needs to be mowed. The hedges need to be trimmed. New flowers are planted. Other ones are removed because it's the wrong season. You deal with storms. You deal with uh, erosion. There's all these problems that come up, and so your yard does not look perfect all the time. And it's because it's natural. It's nature. It's out in the elements. We are creating our own elements inside our homes with these aquariums, but they're not going to be pristine. And to hope for that or to expect it is unreasonable. And I really would like to somehow touch your heart today and hopefully help you understand this so that way you don't get so obsessed with small minor flaws that are happening in your tank. Now, if you have major issues, you have every right to be upset and we definitely want to help you out. And so that's why I always recommend that you ask questions and you go to forums, you join Club Miller's Reef on Facebook, where we can communicate and we can help you hopefully find some solutions to problems that are plaguing you. But if you are so obsessed with trying to have something look exactly like a museum piece, then I recommend you don't add any water and you just put some fake stuff in a glass box and it just becomes a shadow box rather than a living uh, biosphere of life. Because everything that you're putting in that tank will turn around and it will do something. If you put in a fish, it's going to pee in the water, it's going to poop in the water. And you're going to put food in the water for that fish to eat and it's going to continue to do that and you've got this constant cycle of clean and dirt, clean and dirt happening on a regular basis. I also wanted to emphasize today how important it is that you realize that you, you, are part of the cleanup crew. 
and not to expect that you can just pour some magic elixir in your water and it'll take care of itself. Or that you can add a thousand snails and it'll take care of itself. That's not how it works. There are times you're gonna have to get your arm wet, you're gonna have to get your sleeve wet, you're gonna be sitting there up on a stepladder working too long and your back is aching and you're pulling algae or you're rearranging rock or you're siphoning sand beds or whatever it is you're choosing to do because it cannot be done by itself. Just like your yard cannot just look perfect without you interacting with it. Whether you mow it and you use a leaf blower and you use a rake or you hire someone to do it, someone's gotta do the dirty work to make it look nice. And I want you guys to just understand that because I feel like it's being overlooked or set aside. I think too many people think it's just easy to set up an aquarium and expect it to just work out and when it doesn't, they think that they have failed when that's not the case. And then the other thing I want to talk about today is that I want you to also look at the good that's in your tank and not be obsessed with the bad. Because too often we get fixated on one problem and can't enjoy the livestock for what they are. And we definitely want to enjoy our livestock, to love our babies, to feed them and watch them grow and appreciate them for what they are. And to enjoy them under various different color lighting spectrums so that we can say, oh, it's so pretty today. Um, I love this time of day, uh, I prefer, or you, know, you might say, well actually I like it during the daytime when the, the lights are more white. But at the same time, what you've got going on is you have multiple creatures inside a box of water. And this water is limited to the filtration that's hiding beneath or behind it. Now, one of the things that a lot of people are encountering when it comes to working in their tanks with very pristine water, with very clean dry rock, with very clean sand. And I'm seeing it a lot is the dreaded dinoflagellates. And dinoflagellates are a very tough bacteria to eradicate. And unfortunately, when it takes hold in aquariums, very often what ends up happening is that the person gets driven right out of the hobby because it's so impossible to beat. So. There are been, there's actually a huge thread about it on Reef Central and on uh, Reef to Reef talking about how to fight them. There's been articles in reefkeeping.com. There have been vendors that are selling products that are helping to remove uh, dinoflagellates from the system. But in the end, it comes down to what's going on in your own system. Hey, I'm noticing my light is doing that blinking thing again. And how much you wanna bet? I haven't done this in a while. I remember when I was talking to you guys once in the past, I ran into a problem where my wireless microphone was actually affecting the vortex and stopping the flow. So I'm gonna switch this camera to this for now. Hopefully you don't keep seeing the shift of light like you were seeing with that radio on a moment ago because it's not actually doing that. All right, where did I leave off? Somebody remind me. <laughs> okay, pristine sand, pristine rock uh, means low nutrients. And with low nutrients or zero nitrate, zero phosphate, people are running into problems where they are growing these weird algaes and they're having a hard time getting rid of them long term. They just keep coming back. And the reason they keep coming back is because there's, it's, there's an imbalance in the system. It's not natural. The tank needs the bacteria. It needs the algaes. It needs the diatoms. It needs to all equalize. And that happens over time. Now, one of the things that you may need to do to help, um, how do I say this? <laughs> I, want to re I want you to resist the urge to constantly upgrade. There are hobbyists out there that seem to go from one tank to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, all within the first year or two. And when I set up my 29 gallon many years ago, I ran it for seven years. I set up a 55 gallon that I got used and I ran it for two years. I ran the 280 gallon system for six years. I've been running a 400 gallon tank, you know, minus the break, you know, the leak and the rebuild. Uh, since 2011. So try to just enjoy a tank for what it is rather than constantly trying to change or chase something new. And that will actually save you money and save you a lot of frustration. Enjoy the build itself, do the plumbing right, you know, set it up where you love everything about it, and then sit back and enjoy it and feed it and let things happen. And <laughs> if some algae grows, pull it out. And if you aren't getting enough of it out yourself, add to your cleanup crew the critters that you need to add to your tank to help keep it clean. Uh, don't run your lights too long. Don't let your nutrients be too low. Don't let them be too high. You know, that's where we need to find that, that, that balance point. 
And that balance is so important because I think as humans, we are the worst when it comes to going from one extreme to the other. And uh, you can look at every part of life when it comes to humans. For example, my best friend told me that in Hawaii, for the last 19 years, they did an Easter egg hunt for divers. And they had a section of sand that was cordoned off, and inside that sand were 400 Easter eggs were buried. And each egg is numbered so that when they go diving to find all the eggs, they identify that all of them have been retrieved. And this year, a bunch of people on Facebook got very uh, anti-plastic in the oceans and freaked out that they were going to do this Easter egg hunt, and the entire event was canceled. Now, this has been done successfully for 19 years, and suddenly now it's considered, oh no, that's evil, you're hurting the ocean. I don't know that having a hunt for eggs in one day is going to cause chaos in the Hawaiian waters, but apparently some people felt so strongly about it and caused so much chaos online that it was canceled. And that is what I'm talking about when you're going to extremes. Because they're not throwing eggs in the ocean and leaving them there to rot. They're not throwing them in the ocean to have them float away. They're hunting them and retrieving them. And I don't see any problem with that. And I think it sounds like a fun event. I've also seen um, events in the in the fall where they take pumpkins into the ocean and carve them underwater. And pumpkins are not normal to the ocean, but fish will eat it, just like Spock, who's from Hawaii, eats banana. So I wouldn't... Uh, the extremes is the problem. How about finding some middle ground? If they kept throwing eggs in the ocean and they were never finding them all, okay, fair enough, there's a complaint. But with our hobby, we used to fight to get lower nutrients. We wanted to have lower nitrates and lower phosphates. And nowadays, everyone's running these tanks that are so uh, devoid of life, they're actually devoid of nitrate and phosphate so long that people are dosing nitrate and they're dosing phosphate. And I kind of joke, I just want to take the water out of my tank and I want to mail it to you for 80 bucks and you can pour my nitrate into your tank. <laughs> I'm, I'm totally joking. But I mean, think about that. I have high nitrates. I want to eliminate them. You guys have low nitrates and are dealing with these weird issues in your tank. My livestock is not stressing out. And I, and I can tell you part of the reason why. It's, it's not that I have mastered this hobby to the degree where nothing goes wrong. But I don't overreact. And I did a live stream about that. I warned you guys, or I, I had a conversation with you saying, don't overreact. Don't go crazy trying to solve a problem quickly because your livestock will not fare well in that situation. Matter of fact, it may suffer. And so what we want to do instead is we want to give the corals time to adapt to the new changes and then kind of gradually bring it back to where it needs to be so you don't freak them out. And I'm doing that right now with no pox. I'm trying to bring down nitrate that's been up for probably about two years. And I know it's going to suddenly kick in. They're going to drop really quickly. And when they do, I want to adjust my dosage immediately to find a happy medium to where there's some nitrate but not nearly as much as there's been. Now, interestingly, even though I have all this nitrate in my water and I would normally say, well, that could cause major problems with corals, my corals are used to it. They've been in it a long time. But when Dwayne came to visit a couple weeks ago and he gave me a bunch of corals to put in my tank, my first thought was, oh no, we're putting your pristine water corals into my tank. They're all gonna die. And none of them died. They all did well, which is interesting to me because I would have expected them to not like my nitrate-laden water. Um, I'm reading some of your comments real quick here. Uh, the Planted Reef made a really good comment here. I'm going to put this on the page. Too many people are throwing dollars in this hobby and not learning anything. And I feel like education is paramount. Now, I live on social media, and I'm constantly reading the latest posts, and I'm involved with the latest discussions, and I don't know everything, but I like to see what people are talking about. And I also am aware of the old school way of thinking, where in the past, all we had to learn about our aquariums was to read books, or to go to events like Macna and get educated by speakers that were experts in various fields. And we would sit there and listen to them for 45 minutes. And then we would uh, do a question and answer for 15 minutes. And then they were gone. And the next one came in and talked about something entirely different. And you learned, again, something else useful and helpful that made your tank more successful. And this went on for several days till you went home. If, uh, 
if we've completely gotten away from that, if we're at the point now where we want to sit on our computer and watch a YouTuber talk about it, it's important that you're following educational YouTubers. And I like to think I'm one of them. Matter of fact, I tend to educate way more than uh, I do uh, entertain. And I, I kind of wish my videos were more entertaining. I think they would be more uh, popular. But then, usually, if you're entertaining, it's because it was funny, it was exciting, it was hilarious, it was accidental, that kind of thing, and those get a lot of views. Where when you're learning something, the audience is going to be smaller, and that's kind of normal, and that's why my audience is where it is after, you know, three and a half years of making videos. So I, I emphasize education always. I can't even help myself. I, I just seem to be a natural teacher, and I want to help you avoid pitfalls that make you spend more money and struggle with your tank instead of having time to just sit back and enjoy it and sip your coffee. Now, let's, uh... Okay. One of the things that uh, I read recently on social media was some authors. Remember, I was talking a second ago, I was talking about old school and, and books. One of the authors wrote a thread and was discussing the fact that in this day and age, a lot of people are buying ebooks off of Amazon or using the Kindle to read things. And when they do that, uh, you know, it, it lists popular sellers or bestsellers or top 20 or top 100 books. And as he was looking at the list of books, uh, the choices were really pretty poor compared to what we got 15 years ago. And like one popular book, one that was selling well on Amazon, was only 60 pages long and it guaranteed you could set up a tank in seconds. And they were, you know, the other authors were upset with this type of thinking because there's so much to learn. And anyone that's spent any time in this hobby at all has learned that not only do you learn how to take care of water, but you learn to be an electrician, you learn to be a plumber, you learn to be a photographer, you learn to be a chemist. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, and you might even have some uh, construction, you know, as in working with lumber or, uh, or steel, you know, or welding. So, and then there's painting. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I bet I can keep going. I mean, we haven't even mentioned fragging or quarantine and uh, hospital care, you know, that we have to do for our livestock. So there's a lot you actually learn, and you cannot learn that in 60 pages. My website has something like a thousand articles on it to help people answer th those pesky questions that come up. And in that time, there's no way you could read that quickly. And so what people do is they usually Google the one thing they care about and they look up exactly how they want to accomplish a certain thing and they want to watch that video and hope to get the information within three to five minutes and then go apply what they learned rather than getting the deep education that gives you that foundation that you can really lean on as a hobbyist that will help you again avoid overreacting and helping your tank mature and part of the tank maturing is that you are maturing as well because you yourself have to be able to see the nuances of your tank and see the slight changes and be able to judge does it need anything right now or can it can you sit back and kind of let it go do you have to interact with it do you need to course correct immediately you know what what's the the big push so let's take for example this week um, I'm actually uh, well let me just pre preface it preface it that uh, I started this hobby in 1998 so this is my 21st year. And this week I was out in front of my house, I was hosing off a filter sock because I thought I might use one for once. And it was, you know, six months dirty, so it was time to wash it. And uh, <laughs> that, it was six months dirty sitting in the corner. It wasn't sitting in my tank for six months. And while I'm out there, you hear this big kapow and you see all the power lines across the street, the house across from you right above it are just exploding with fire. And there's that sound of an electrical surge that, you know, you can't compare to anything. It's just powerful and uh, eye-awakening. And when it happened, everything in the neighborhood went dead. It wasn't just like a few houses. It took down like a quarter of a mile. Everyone was dead, including the fire department. Completely dead. And as soon as I saw it, I dropped what I was doing, and I ran down there to make sure everyone's okay and see what had actually happened, because there was a house in my way. And as I came around the corner, I watched purple electricity travel 80 feet across a wire in less than a second just just burn it all and then it collapsed to the floor to the ground 
and there was lines hanging down on both sides of the street at an angle. So the cars, there's two lanes going north and two lanes going south. And the wire hung across one lane on one side and hung across one lane on the other side. And the wire is about this wide. And so when people are coming at 45 miles an hour, they don't see it. So I didn't even have my phone on me at the time because I was out you know, working with water and I didn't have my pocket. So I ran out there and I'm seeing all this happening. I saw a lady call 911. And so in the meantime, I thought, well, let me help direct some traffic. But at the same time, my, my friend was here, Bobby, and he said, you know, your whole house is dead. And I was like, well, the whole neighborhood is dead, so I'm not surprised. But I have a generator and I have battery backups, so my tank will be okay. And I didn't really sweat it. And I spent about 20 minutes instead helping navigate traffic through the one safe lane on either side of the median until the fire department got there and then later the police got there and they took over. And because anyone that ignored me, you know, because you, you're telling them, slow down, stop, you know, you're waving your hands, and they're looking at you like you're insane, and they just keep coming at full speed. And then they hit the wire, and of course they slam on the brakes. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, why do you think I was telling you to slow down? And so they creep through, and the wire's dragging across their car. And, you know, then other cars behind them see what's happening, and they scooch over finally. And eventually I just started standing in their lane and blocking them, so they had to go to the safe lane. And I'd jump across the median and do the same thing on that side. And, uh, yeah, so that was a big mess. Now, what was the result of me coming back inside after all this had happened? Well, the good news is, whatever had happened, whatever had burned up, it didn't actually destroy the power in the neighborhood. It basically tripped some breakers back at wherever electricity comes from. And they restarted the neighborhood. So we all had power again. And with my tank, the only two things that happened was the circulation pump on my uh, big saltwater vat, the one behind this wall, Toast. Completely destroyed. Will not come to life. It was blazing hot uh, when you put your hand on it. Uh, I, I'm just replacing it with something different, and I'm looking forward to that. And then I discovered that one of the two power supplies to my Vortec pumps has finally reached the end of its life after uh, nine years. And so I contacted Ecotech and said I need new power supplies immediately. And they got them shipped out the very next day, and they were basically air freighted. You know, they're here the, next, the day after that. So I've got two power supplies now on my Vortex, and I feel good because I know that I can trust them to restart properly every single time uh, if there's a need. Got a good run out of them, it's just they had to be replaced. So being prepared either to have those things on hand, and I have a lot of power supplies for Vortex, but I didn't have any for the MP60s. So it was smart for me to go ahead and look closely at my gear after this big power shortage and make sure my tank was okay. So I wanted to kind of bring you up to date on that one because... Things happen to all of us, and the accidents that occur, if you're hearing about it, maybe it helps you prep your own system for what you can do to avoid having the same problem happen for you. Like you might say, oh, you know what, I want to get some extra power supplies too, because you never know when those bricks is going to fail. Uh, let's see. So I talked to you about not upgrading constantly. <laughs> And uh, I talked to you about not trying to keep a pristine tank. And uh, that's pretty much my whole... I mean, it, it's not a deep thought. It's not a long, lengthy discussion. It's more a matter of accepting that your tank is going to go through various things to where you have to allow it to evolve. It's going to have to uh, grow through the various ugly algae phases and there was a guy that did a thread recently in Club Milo's Reef, and he said, I want my sand to stay white. I'm starting to get the dreaded uh, diatoms. And I was like, why are they dreaded? They're totally normal. That's what bacteria eats. You want those. <laughs> because when you have diatoms, then the bacteria eats that, and the bacteria grow in number, and then they can handle the waste that's coming off your fish and off your corals. So, yeah, have some diatoms. That's okay. Diatoms are not to be dreaded. Dinoflagellates, maybe he mixed it up with that. Those are definitely dreaded, and we don't want those in our tank. And they seem to occur in tanks that are too low on nitrate and phosphate, you know, basically reading 0, 0. So let's try to avoid letting that happen. Alrighty. Um, I'm going to stick this on the screen just because I do it each time I'm on the live stream. So Club Miller's Reef is on Facebook, and it is, I think we're around 4,500 people in there right now. And we work very hard to keep the peace. And we make sure that everyone gets along and that we're nice to each other and that we answer each other's questions. And that is the, the only rule of that group is to treat others kindly. So as long as you guys are abiding by that, you're welcome. And if you can't, then go away. 
<laughs> go to the angry groups. Get out of my group. <laughs> and uh, I'm also going to stick this on here. And I want to stick this on here too. So on Facebook.com, I have a page that's Mila's Reef Inc. And that is where I share a lot of interesting things every single day uh, that I come across on the web that I think you might enjoy. And that is the page for my company. And then, of course, the larger font at the bottom, milosreef.com, is my company where I sell products, uh, whether it be Live Rock Enhance or uh, Vortec uh, pumps or uh, acrylic things I build myself. These are all things that I do uh, to help pay the bills and to, uh, to help make your reefing a little bit easier because I'm selling you the various things that I use myself in my tank. So I do appreciate any kind of business you throw my way. And uh, I always ask you guys to not forget me when you're shopping for new things. And I do want to thank you guys. I want to point out something about last weekend. So when I was in Tulsa, I did a booth. And I haven't done a booth in probably a year and a half. And I discovered that setting up a booth and bringing all the, the goods with me, I wasn't selling anything because everyone wanted to come up and meet me because I was on YouTube. And I, I'm glad. You know, I, I love meeting you guys and talking with you and hearing about your tanks and stuff. But if I don't sell anything in that booth, uh, it becomes expensive uh, one way or another, whether it was the, the cost involved in traveling, the cost in shipping the, the stuff there, the lack of sales themselves, you know, when that's how I make a living. That was a problem. And this last weekend, a lot of people came through the booth and bought things. And I want to thank you for being willing to do that because I don't do those very often. I kind of felt like maybe I was past the selling in a booth thing just because everyone wanted to just talk and visit and catch up and... and uh, and say hi, and I totally get that. And I, uh, you know, I, mm, I just, I try to always have things in the booth that I know you're going to need, and hope you'll just stock up on a few things while you're standing in front of me. So those that do that, I really appreciate it. All right. So let's answer some of your questions today, because I think that would be fun to do. I haven't done that in a little while. I saw someone asking earlier about Live Rock Enhance. I forgot what their question was though. Maybe they're asking for an update and how it's working. All right, let me just scroll up to this one. Um, we're going to start with this one from Frank the Tank. I have a question for all of you. I'm considering switching from BRS 2 part to Bionic. Does anyone have any experience with switching? I can tell you this. Um, I have, in the past, used Bionic very successfully, and I love that product. And not only is it alkalinity and calcium, it also has something like 80 other trace elements in the bottle. So when I was dosing just that to my 29 gallon and my 55 gallon aquariums daily, I was pouring it in, it worked really well and my, both my tanks were beautiful. And it was super easy to use. And for those size tanks, it was economical. When you're doing it with bigger tanks like this, I'm blown away that people want to use two-part dosing for huge tanks. And there are people that do it. I mean, Jimmy Pop Colson, I did a video of his tank in Las Vegas I don't know, eight, nine years ago, uh, eight, nine months ago. And his tank is all SPS, and he's dosing basically a gallon of each solution every single day. <laughs> so he's mixing up five gallons at a time or 10 gallons at a time. And that's a lot of work. For big systems, it makes sense to have a calcium reactor. For the smaller ones, I can totally understand the dosing. And for the really small tanks, you know, the all in ones, the ones that sit on a countertop or behind your sofa, uh, you know, or, or you know, even like I said, a 55, that's not that big, or a 90. I could see you dosing Bionic and being very happy with that product. And nowadays with dosing pumps, it's so much easier than what we did. We were manually adding it, trickling it in, in an area of high flow. And you definitely want to do that. Even if you're dosing, dose into an area of high flow to where it's mixing into the water quickly and not just becoming a cloud of calcium and a cloud of magnesium and a cloud of alkalinity. Um, give you another view of the anemone cube. I'll look at these questions. So right here on the front are all these little purple spots. These are all coralline that haven't gotten off the glass yet. I uh, have been dosing magnesium recently, and whenever I do that, you start seeing it on the glass. All right. Uh, Mr. Reefbuster asked me, where, do you, where does he get the t-shirt I'm wearing? Well, it would really help if I knew the name of this company by heart. <laughs> um, dang it. Hmm. What if I, since I'm off camera, what if I pull the shirt off so I can read the back really quick and tell you the name?
Alrighty. It's North American Coral Labs. They're here in Texas. They're actually in my town. Now I'm dressed again. I can come back on camera. <laughs> and it was a really cool shirt. And we were joking about this shirt because, you know, it kind of maybe make, might make you think of a show on AMC. Um, but it also might make you think of a certain cereal. And you might think these corals are, gr no, I mean, really cool corals. <laughs> There's a lot going on in this shirt, but it's really cool. And uh, I had to have one. So that one I got from him. Oh, I see Andrew already answered you a few minutes ago. Oh, well, that's me working my way down the list. <sighs> Rogue Aquariums, I'm sorry to tell you, the mug that you dropped is gone. That was a limited edition. I only printed a certain amount of those mugs, and I have not ordered any more. So now, those of you that have a Milos Reef mug, don't drop it, because you will not get the same one again. I am thinking about ordering some new mugs, and uh, I might just do that here uh, this summer and make that available to you guys, because I think they're pretty cool. I enjoy mine. All right. Rudrick, I love that name, says, can I call in and ask a question? So let's assume for a moment you literally mean call in with a telephone and ask a question live, like a radio station. That is not what the live stream is on YouTube, but you can post your question here on YouTube and I'll answer you. Um, I do have people that go to my website and find my phone number and call me up and ask me questions on a daily basis. And I definitely answer the phone and I do answer questions. And I try to help people. And uh, it, I always get a, a, a grin when I hear them say, you sound just like you do on YouTube. Or when I'm at the shows and they say, you act just like you act on YouTube. <laughs> and I really think that people think I act a certain way on camera and then act differently the rest of them. This is literally me. I am a nerd. This is how I'm going to be around the clock. And the only time I don't act this way is when I'm asleep. Other than that, I pretty much live and breathe this hobby all day long. And I do it for a living. So, there you go. Dustin, uh, he said he's going to be picking up an RODI system for me soon. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I have more, um, more RODI parts coming in. They should be here by Tuesday. Another pallet of parts. I have been ordering a pallet of parts pretty much every month this year, trying to keep up with orders, which is awesome. And let's see. So I'm looking for questions here, just so you know. Uh, Tristan asks, how much flow is too much flow? And that's a good question because it is kind of hard to gauge something because we can't say you need this many gallons per hour or you need this, this many gallons per minute. So instead, what we're looking at is what is the livestock doing in your flow? If the uh, anemones, for example, were being just pummeled and being ripped off the rock, if the LPS polyps of your coral were popping off the skeletons, if things never open up, they're just sealed tight because they're being hit by a blast of water, that's too much flow. Uh, typically, we cannot mimic the flow that's in the ocean. We are constantly trying to have a good amount, but the ocean is way more harsh and way more powerful than we can ever generate in our systems. And uh, there's lots of reasons for that, but mainly that we are probably being economical <laughs> and we're not spending thousands of dollars to try and mimic what storms can do in the ocean, for example. How corals can be pounded with massive waves and then have some periods that are very still. When I was diving in Bonaire at night, I was actually thinking who turned off the flow because there was so little flow. It just seemed like nothing in the water was even moving. And I was kind of surprised. I expected some kind of activity at night. And that one particular spot, that one night, the water, you know, all the particulates were like staying still. They were like, like just barely moving. I was like, what is going on? It was, it was a weird, surreal moment for me because we constantly think about flow equals life equals, you know, uh, success. But uh, if you are, if you're not sure about how much flow to use, one of the things you can do to kind of get your tank used to it, instead of having your power head like right here, hitting directly into your livestock, you can put it up higher and blow across the front or you can put it on the back wall and blow it toward the front of the tank. Or you can have it on the side pointing toward the front to ricochet out the front and go back. So it's doing a V type movement. And that may be a good way for you to handle learning what's best for your livestock. But eventually you'll be able to put things pretty much anywhere and they will just accept what you're doing. 
or they'll cr they'll grow into that area and do exactly what you were hoping. So that I hope will help you a little bit. Um, Glenn Smith asks, how often do you feed your corals? How long do you keep the pumps off? And when should you turn the skimmer back on afterwards? Well, every single day I have an auto feeder dropping food into all of my tanks, all three, and it drops in flake food. It's uh, this stuff right here that is absolutely unavailable and cannot be purchased anymore. It's awesome. I love marine ships, and I'm very mad at Instant Ocean for getting rid of it. They swear they still have it. They, you know, some other kind. It's not. It's not the same. But I found a whole stash of this a while back, and I hoarded it all. And it goes to my auto feeders until I run out one day, and then I'm not sure what I'm going to do besides sit in the corner and cry. But this goes in my tank every day. Um, two times. And then at night, I feed frozen food. And when I feed the frozen food, what I do is I melt it in some tank water for about 15 minutes. And then I will turn off the return pump by hitting this yellow button. And when the return pump turns off, the water drops in the tank slightly because it breaks the siphon and you know, no more water drains down. And the protein skimmer is turned off. And then in this tank, the vortex stops blowing on the other side. And the tentacles kind of stop moving as much. And all you have is some water trickling in from a separate pump, which is a Vectra. So return pump off in here, skimmers off in here. This return pump is on, but it's moving slowly, and the main flow, the, the MP40 Vortec, is turned off. And I use a pipette, and I squirt frozen food into here. I feed a bunch into this tank. I feed some to the frag tank. And then I come back with what's left, you know, the, the scraps, and I pour that in here for these guys one more time. And then after 10 minutes, the return pump turns on, and the Vortec turns on. And then five minutes after that, my protein skimmer turns on. And I've been doing that for a long time, for years, and uh, it's worked out really well for me. All right. Um, the whole thing about anemones and flow is interesting to me, because I've had a lot of people give me opinions on my anemone cube tank, and they say, if you had less flow, you'd have better bubbles, or if you had more flow, you'd have better bubbles, or if you had more light, you'd have better bubbles, or if you had less light, you'd have better bubbles. I've tried lots of different things on this tank and nothing ever changes. These anemones always look like this. And occasionally somewhere up high, I will see a few tiny bubbles on a few of the little tiny anemones, but it never looks like those gorgeous bubbles that we see that seem to come from either aquaculture facilities or the ocean itself. I kind of wish I could do it, but for some reason I cannot. And who knows, maybe one day I'll figure it out. I would love to figure it out. <laughs> because if you Google this topic and, and read and read and read and read and read, you'll find out that nobody knows where the bubbles come from. But in my uh, frag tank, I have these smaller anemones, like these guys up here and you know, the little ones up there. And this whole section here in the middle is a bunch of little ones. Uh, I guess I should say right there. These are big ones down here. And of course, the roses are huge. And in the frag tank, I have these little anemones that have a lot of bubbles and they look really good, but they don't look like those super inflated bubbles that we, we love the most. Um, Kev asks me, have you ever used Red Sea Coral Colors? I've just started dosing it and I wanted to know your thoughts on the product. Actually, I bought all of it. I bought all four ABCD and I realized I had so little of it that even if I did dose it, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference because my tank was so big. And so I ended up just uh, selling them to someone for less than I paid just to get them off my shelf because they've been sitting here so long. I feel that uh, maybe they would do something. I, I know when I asked the fish store by me, Frank's tanks, I asked him, what do you do? He says he pours all of them into one bottle and just doses that into the tank. I don't even know if you are supposed to do that. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he felt that that was good enough for him. For me, I would have had to have gallons of it and... Uh, I already do other things, so I really wasn't leaning that direction to try that out. Uh, if I wanted to at some point, I could try it out on the frag system since that's a 60-gallon closed ecosystem. And then I could actually do a test and see what it does. And who knows, maybe at some point I'll give it a try. Um, let's see. John asks that, or he's saying that his skims skimmer gets the skimmate all around the neck, but it doesn't get into the collection cup. And do I have any ideas? When you're running a protein skimmer, and I've got a couple of protein skimmer videos on this channel, so be sure to watch them if you have time. 
uh, you're going to want the bubbles that are boiling away in the neck of the skimmer. You know, here's your collection cup on top, and then you've got usually an area this big underneath where you can see like the neck, and then you've got the body of the skimmer. You want the foam to be breaking the bubbles at the base of that cup that I was describing. And if you can do that and keep the neck itself clean, that stuff will push into the cup. It will never be mud laying in the cup necessarily. I, I, let me take the word never away from there. It's not common that you'll end up with mud in your cup. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But it's going to be more like skimmate. And it's going to be... Uh, dark green, dark brownish green, kind of muddy looking, but not the not like pudding. Usually when that happens, something's going on in your tank, and I've seen that on occasion as well. But for the most part, expect some liquid in your cup, and you'll have more of this crud on the inside of the neck, and that's why I tell people to clean the neck of their skimmer on a regular basis so that the skimming bubbles can push the dirt up and out as quickly as it can. And in the old days, before I did the skimmer swabby, which is a squeegee that cleans the neck, I had the... Uh, the cup off in the sink every single day. I would just clean it. it. Took me a minute, and I cleaned the cup and put it back on my skimmer, and I cleaned it every single night. While I was feeding the tank, I cleaned the skimmer cup. So maybe you'll find that just by cleaning the neck more frequently, you may be more pleased with the results of what your collection cup is pulling out. But it's uh, it's not basically the replacement of uh, a water change. It's more like a way to get the crud out of the system as it's happening. But we still have to keep cleaning it. Um, Jordan says, my tank just finished cycling. Congratulations. And I have no traces of algae. Should I hold off on adding a cleanup crew? Yes. You do not need a cleanup crew yet. Uh, your tank is new. The cycle is done. You are, I would even recommend you don't run the lights too long per day while there's nothing really in there. Uh, you know, if you add a fish or two, you don't need 8 to 12 hours of light on your tank for those fish. Uh, the, when you start adding some corals, you're going to want to add some light to the tank. But if you add a bunch of light to an empty tank that is finished cycling, you'll end up growing a bunch of algae. And then you're adding a cleanup crew. And then as the cleanup crew devours the algae and some of it dies or they kill each other, you start raising ammonia levels in the tank and it's almost like you're starting the cycle again. <laughs> so rather than just adding a cleanup crew, don't do it yet. Your tank doesn't quite need it. Let's add a little bit of livestock and see how your tank does. Keep on top of your water tests every weekend. I always recommend water test Saturday. Test your water parameters and see where things are going. And as you start to see algae, start adding that cleanup crew because you definitely want to stay ahead of it before it gets out of hand. But I would say you're probably a month out from needing to get any kind of cleanup crew critter. <laughs> uh, yes, Reef Dudes, I am a real person. And why are you in plural? Still waiting to hear the answer to that one. Ah, oh, boy, this one's a hard one. Todd asks, can I drill holes in a tank that's already set up? I want to add a sump to my 30 gallon. You know, Todd, I lived through one of those questions a long time ago. I had a 29 gallon with no holes in the back, and I ended up doing all my plumbing over the top and out the back. And I did it like that for years because, as you were saying, can I drill the tank while it's running? Here's part of the problem. If the tank is made of glass, which I'm going to assume it might be, and you're trying to drill a hole right here, drilling this way is not how they drill through glass. They almost always drill through glass straight down. So you take your tank and you turn it on its side and you drill downward and you usually have to have a little dam of putty or something around to keep the water in there. You add a little bit of water and you drill and bore a hole through the glass, which takes about three to five minutes until it carves its way all the way through. And can't really do that on the side of a tank because even if you stood here and had someone with a hose adding water and you're trying to drill this way, Keeping that bit straight and equally pressed on the glass can be almost impossible to do. So no, I don't recommend that. I would recommend that if you're determined to drill the tank, either remove the tank, you know, get it outside and do the drilling process and just get it over with, or get a new tank and drill it and do a tank transfer and put that one in place where the old one was and start anew. That would be my recommendation. But uh, the other choice, of course, is don't drill it at all. And that's how, with my 29 gallon, I had a hang on back skimmer. I had a hang on back overflow box. I ended up doing a over the top closed loop for internal flow in that tank for many years. And just because I didn't want to break down my tank because I needed a couple of holes. So that is my answer for you on that one. And uh, to, it looks like you asked this also, how are the hang on types 
they're great. I mean, lots of people do it. There are different kinds on the market. Life Reef makes a really nice one. Um, eShops has some with tubes that are simple to use and simple to set up. I even have an article on my website showing how to set one up and how to make sure it keeps running properly and how to test it in a power outage. So you definitely want to make sure that your tank will not overflow and uh, that way you'll be super happy with your tank and you won't be so fearful of it. Uh, let's see. Um, Mark asks, what dive lights did you use in Bon Air? I'm off to the Red Sea and need some new video lights. They were called Sea Life. And each light was 1500 lumens. So you should be able to find that on Amazon without too much trouble. I think you would look up Sea Life 3000 lumens and a light kit. And it was set up with a frame in the middle with handles that you could actually put a GoPro in the middle if that's what you're going to use. I shot everything with I did with an iPhone. Todd asks, will you be at Reef of Palooza in New York? I've never been to the New York Reef of Palooza, and that's one I want to go to. But I don't know if I'm going to have time in June. I might be busy with a big project I'm working on. So I don't know. And I just missed the Reef of Palooza in Florida. I couldn't make that one either. Uh, the auto feeder seems like a waste to me, is what Free Your Mind said. That is the opposite of someone with a free open mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the auto feeder is super convenient, especially when I travel, because it drops in food. And uh, initially I set it up to only drop in food when I was out of town. And then I decided, you know what, I was going to keep them running. And so I have to fill them up about once a month, and they feed my tanks and my fish get something to eat. And so they don't have to just wait for one meal a day. Because in nature, fish are going to be swimming in the ocean. They're not just eating once a day, they're eating every single moment they can find food. And we kind of limit to what they can have. And so... If they get hit with food a couple times a day, I see nothing wrong with that at all, and I don't mind having auto feeders on there. <laughs> Kelly asked, is there any options besides the Apex? I haven't been elected to Congress yet. <laughs> Are you saying that only congressmen can afford the Apex? Because that's crazy talk. Um, what size is your tank, Kelly? If you, I saw someone recently set up a smaller tank. I think it was like a 30 or 40. And maybe it was even smaller, and they had all the Apex gear. And I was like, wow, I, let me commend you on the fact that you set up a control on such a small system. And the owner said, oh, actually, what I had done was I had broken down my bigger tank and moved what livestock I wanted to keep in the smaller tank, and so I used that equipment. I was like, okay, that makes more sense, because you don't often see people do that. Even though having a controller is ideal to helping keep your tank safe and, and stable and maintained, and, uh, yeah, I've been running an aqua controller. That's what they used to be called since 2004. Mine came with the tank I bought used. It was destroyed by a flood, and I shipped it back to Neptune Systems, and they put a brand-new motherboard in and rebuilt it. And, I don't know, a couple of hundred bucks later, I had an aqua controller that I could use, and I've never looked back. And there is a smaller version. I think it's called EL. And that one's like $500 instead of $800 for the full uh, Apex. Once you have it and you start using it, you'll start realizing how much you'll enjoy it. Now, are there other options? There is another brand on the market called eCoral. And uh, I got to play with it for a few seconds when I was at Macna last year. And uh, it had a lot of modules, too. And it might be a little bit less expensive. I, I don't know. I, haven't, I have no personal experience with it. But that's one more example. And there's probably a few out there. But... By far, the most popular controller is the Apex, and the most people use it, which means when you have questions, you have more people to answer your questions versus adopting software that other people are not using nearly as much. You know, you're trying, your, your group becomes smaller trying to get help. Let's see. Mike asks, is there any good te uh, techniques for removing and relocating bubble tip anemones? Well... I've had to do that on occasion. In this tank, I don't remove them myself. I uh, just let them climb on the glass. And once they're on the glass, I can just scoop one off with a credit card and I can hand it to a person and they leave. And that works out really well for me. But um, there are a couple of methods. One thing you can do is you can hold the rock upside down over the water so that the anemone is hanging straight down and the weight of it will help as you get your fingernail under the foot and you pry it out. 
And so you would get your, your fingernail right there and you're holding the rock like this and you're kind of getting in there and kind of working your way, your finger in to pull the anemone loose from the rock work. That's one method. Another method is to take ice cubes and hold them against the foot of the anemone, you know, the, the, the base, the trunk, and you keep doing it. But you'll go through a lot of ice cubes because ice cubes melt quickly in our 75 to 79 degree water. And I remember doing it once and I must have gone through 19 ice cubes till I finally got my anemone out of this one crevice it was in. And what it is is it gets cold, so it's retracting to get away from you. But usually the entire anemone is retracting rather than just like pulling its foot back. And so it's kind of a, a tricky situation. But for the most part, I'm more of a manual guy. I will take the rock and I will remove it or I'll turn it and I'll get a credit card or my fingernail and I get under that anemone and I force it off the rock. That is my technique. Let's see. Tristan, my anemone got sucked into the power head. What should I do? I don't know when this happened. You didn't give us more details, but I'll tell you this, that when anemones get chopped up by a power head, two things often happen. Uh, the first one is the anemone gets badly damaged, and it can end up sending out nematocysts into your tank, and those stingers can kill your other fish and livestock as it lands on everything. So that's a downside. And the other part is sometimes the anemone survives. And so if you can just turn off the pump, and maybe take the pump and the power head, you know, the anemone and just set it down on the bottom and let them retract themselves apart. The anemone may pull itself out of there, or you might have to help it out. It, it's going to be one of those things where you have to kind of figure out what works best for you and how long you're willing to wait. But uh, what I always recommend is that you always have a cover on your power head to protect it from anything getting sucked in. And so in my case, for years, I had a foam sponge. And every single night, I turn off that pump when I fed the tank. And I took the sponge off and I washed it and then I put it back on the pump and I started it up again and I never ever not once had an enemy go into that pump and this tank's been running for over five years. Then about mm, a year ago I made that acrylic cage that's sitting there which you can see in this video right here right here and I take this cage off about once a month the coralline looks fantastic on it it's kind of amazing to me and I take the cage off and I take it to the sink with a toothbrush and I hit it really quick under tap water to kind of knock off the things that bother me. And then I go ahead and I uh, put it back in the tank and the coralline doesn't die. And I'm amazed because I would think that the fresh water would really hurt the stuff. But it's held up really well and now it's kind of blended in and I like it. Initially I was trying to keep it clear because the acrylic is clear. And that way it was semi-invisible. But uh, I'm actually liking the coralline look that I've got going on there. And I've had anemones. You can see some anemones at the top right there. And I've had some walking along the edge there, and nothing bad has happened. They've just walked on past it and kept going. So always protect your power heads from uh, anemones being sucked in. And typically, like I said, using a sponge is the best method. It's the easiest one, and you can remove it for cleaning. Uh, the Vortex make a foam guard, and uh, if you have Vortex pumps, you need that foam guard, let me know. A lot of people have asked me if I can make the cage for their tank, their different pumps. Well, I made it for the MP40. And I could probably make it for the MP60, but I can't make it for the MP10 because it's too small. And you need someone that can make that that has a laser cutter. Or you can have someone 3D print a cage around it that you can set around it. That's another option that I've seen available. So, let's see. Um, Steven says, I'm in Texas and I'm concerned about heat. And you don't run a chiller. That's correct, I don't. And I do have a couple of cooling fans that blow down on the water of my sump as needed based on when the apex calls for it. So I basically keep my home comfortable because I work from home and I'm here all the time. And uh, I keep the house temperature around 71, 72 degrees, I guess. And then the fan comes on at like 79 degrees and turns off at 78 and a half. So basically, if the tank gets to 79 or higher, my fan is running until the tank temperature comes down a little bit and then finally it shuts off. And I try not, I used to, in the past, I would use a, uh, a mechanical timer that would just turn it on from like 3 p.m. till one in the morning. But I like that the Apex controller will turn the fan on and off based on true tank temperature rather than me just giving it 15 hours of air. Okay. Luke says that he loves my purple tang and would like to put two in a 120, and how aggressive are they? And uh, 
and do they eat algae? I, I think that's what you're asking there. Yeah, they definitely love algae. You may be able to put a couple of purples in a tank together, but that's kind of uncommon. Usually, they're better off by themselves. Um, if you had a mated pair, that would be even nicer. <laughs> that would be ideal. But, uh, yeah, they can kind of be a dominant tang in your tank, and you definitely don't want to uh, cause chaos. If you put them in at the same time, you might be lucky. It might work out for a while, but I don't know if it's going to work out long term. All right. Let's see. I see lots of you guys in here today. Right now we're at 181 people. That's pretty cool. Okay, here's a good one. My favorite topic in the world. <laughs> and I'm laughing because it's so true. I'm not lying about it. I love Phosphate RX. I've been pushing that product for 10 years, trying to get you guys to understand how much I love it. And uh, I still use it. So um, I tried it, and it lowered a little bit. Nothing like you from 1.0 to 0 0.03 in one night. Um, all right, so first of all, Dale, when you dose Phosphate RX and you follow the directions, it's six drops per 10 gallons of liquid volume. That is to drop at 0.5. So if you're at 1.0 and you dosed that amount, you should have been down to 0.5 the next night or the next morning. And then if you dosed it again, like two days later, and hit the tank again, it would go from 0.5 to almost zero the next time. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. So the first thing you want to find out, or I need to know, is did your tank get cloudy from adding phosphate RX? Because that is exactly how you know that the flocculent is working, that it turned it into a solid. And then what did you use to export it? Did you have a filter sock on there that was 10 microns, which is very, very, very fine? Or did you just have to a regular filter sock, which really won't stop it? Did you have a protein skimmer pulling it out? Did you do a water change? You know, what did you do? But... Uh, there's no reason to literally take it from 1.0 to 0.003 or 0.03 in a day. Uh, that's, that's just overachieving. You definitely want to bring it down, and like I said, dosing it every couple of days until you get it all the way down would be smart. And I have had times, which I mentioned in the past, but maybe you hadn't heard it, I've had times in the past where my tanks had gotten all the way up to 3.0 in phosphate, and I would just dose every other day for two weeks until I got my phosphates back down to near zero levels again. So I'll keep scrolling through the comments and see if you reply more, because I'm a little bit behind. Uh, so since I said no to the New York one, <laughs> someone asked, well, are you going to go to the Reef of Palooza in California in August? I don't know. Um, I was invited to possibly go to Australia in August. I might want to see the Great Barrier Reef. I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. I've got another trip in mind that has nothing to do with that that I'm thinking about doing. Also, there's so many things coming up. It's just really hard for me to decide what to do and how many hours in the day I have. Okay, so I found another comment from Dale. I have 400 gallons. How many drops do I put in if I have phosphates at 0.25? All right, so we're using more specific numbers. 400 divided by 10 is 40. And normally you would use six drops to drop at half, but you're not coming down half. You're coming down 0.25, so you need three drops. So you need 120 drops of phosphate RX to bring your 0.25 to near zero levels. Look at that. I did math on camera without making mistakes. Um... Doug says, is there any suggestions on testing flow in a newer tank? Uh, one of the easiest ways is to pour something in your tank that's obvious. Uh, for example, if you had Purple Up, which is a product that's sold by Kent to help grow coralline in your tank, you can pour that into your tank and watch how the water moves through the tank from the power heads. Uh, another trick you could use that uh, might be simpler because you already have it is flake food, and drop the flake food in and see how it blows around in the tank. But I like the purple up because it's a white, milky cloud, and you'll watch the cloud move, and you'll see it being really dense, and then it'll kind of dissipate and maybe swing down underneath, and you can actually watch it. With flakes, it's going to be like confetti going everywhere. It's kind of hard to tell what's happening. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Reef and Dive says, I've been giving my fish a mix of shrimp, octopus, fish, vitamin C, nori, and gelatin, making my own frozen food. That's a recipe of the other Brazilian dudes. Is that okay to use as DIY frozen food? It seems okay. Um, the gel binder may not be necessary. I never used one when I made my own fish food. I have an article on my website where I, I used a, a food processor and a bunch of frozen food that was a like shrimp, scallops, uh, squid, octopus, uh, clam. The only thing I threw away was the real imitation, imitation crab meat. Because if it's imitation, I don't want it. So that I would throw out. That was the one thing I threw away. Uh, mussels were fine. And then I would add other things to that as well, including spirulina powder. And I would uh, add some of the different frozen foods I had. I just kind of chopped it all up and blended it all up so I had all different sizes of food. And I like to have some coarse food, and I like to have some very fine food. And so I would sometimes freeze some of it that was larger and then keep processing to make it finer in a separate bag. And that way I could make sure I had the right sizes for whatever size fish were in my tank. Because you don't want to give really large fish tiny little crumbs, and you don't want to have really big food going into the mouths of tiny fish that can't get it past their jaw. So you kind of have to find that sweet spot. But yeah, you can definitely make your own. I was just talking with Dwayne about this last night. We, we were on the phone a lot lately, and he was saying how his, uh, he made his own fish food, but after he bought everything he needed, he spent a hundred bucks. And he said, you know, if I'm spending a hundred bucks, why am I not just buying Rod's food or Larry's food? And I said, yeah, why aren't you? Because that's what I do. I just get my own food at the fish store. I support the local fish store and I buy some fish food and I throw that in my freezer rather than spending all that time in my kitchen making Ziploc bags or ice cube trays. I did it in the past and I've gotten to the point where I, it's just easier to just buy some fish food and just use it. But I get it. I get it. You know, it just depends. If you're like Dwayne and I and you're using the high dollar stuff, you're really not saving any money. You might feel better because you know exactly what you're putting in the tank you know, because you bought the ingredients. But yeah. Uh, Trunda asked the question, what were your hobbies prior to reefing? <sighs> well, I used to run a bulletin board system years ago, a BBS, and that was a big hobby of mine, and I did the support software for the, uh, the BBS, as well as coded some games. I did all that. I spent a lot of time at my computer. I told you guys I was a nerd. And I also enjoyed photography back then. And I have taken photography further with the uh, aquarium hobby because I'd gotten involved with macro photography and I've really enjoyed that. So that was kind of my major ones. You know, I didn't really have anything. I've, I've always enjoyed woodwork, working, uh, building things, whether it was smaller things like cabinetry all the way up to building houses. But you can't really call building a house a, a hobby <laughs> unless it's your own and you spend 20 years doing it. All right. Let's see. Okay, so the purple tang question. Matt's made the comment that if you did three or more purple tangs, it should be okay. And that's true. But again, we're dealing with how big is the tank? You know, I think he said it was a 120. And, you know, that's going to start off great. You can have three adorable purple tangs in there. And having a group of them is better than two. So that may work. But you may discover as they get larger, you're going to have to split them up and send them to other homes. I don't think long-term you're going to get away with that. Hey, I've gotten to the bottom of the questions. I always like it when I'm close by. Um, okay. <laughs> have you ever had the auto feeder fall into your tank while doing maintenance? I have never dropped an auto feeder in the tank while I was cleaning the tank. I watched Spock, my NASO, pull the entire auto feeder and chimney into the tank because the chimney was made a certain size. And she got in there and was kicking her tail, and she pulled the entire thing down into the tank. And so the auto feeder was busy doing the spinning thing. And as it was sinking in the tank, it was spinning around and around and around. The actual drum was turning, and the food was going everywhere. And uh, I watched her do it, and I was like, wow. And that's when I changed the way I make my chimneys. And I've been making this style of chimney, which you guys can... I'll do this real quick. Hey, look. We got a snail. So here's the chimney. And it's just a small square hole that sits on top of the overflow box. And then I just put the Eheim on top. And then we'll just do a demonstration while we're watching live on camera. 
So it spins around and drops some food in there, and then you will see all the clownfish start to smell it, and they'll all start swimming into that spot here in a moment. Let me switch the angle, because you've already seen what happens on top. So let's see if anyone notices. Let me turn this off. But no, if I'm working on the tank, I'll move the auto feeder out of my way to make sure it doesn't actually accidentally fall in. So I think they noticed the flake food. As you can see, that hippo needs to get out of that tank pretty soon. She's getting too big. Too many tentacles to avoid. When she was one in, she was great in that tank. But now that she's probably, oh, three and a half inches long, maybe more, I'm going to have to catch her. But I love her because of her color. Adding that blue to the tank is so nice. All right, so first free your mind said, didn't like the auto feeder. Then said, have you ever dropped an auto feeder in your tank? And now he admit, admitted that he dropped one in. Just because you dropped one in the tank doesn't mean it's a bad item to have. It just means you got to be more careful. <laughs> Okay, so Kelly, the food is not going down the overflow at all. That's the beauty of this chimney. Because what happens is the food sits inside that square hole and it, it gets wet and then it starts to sink. Or in my case, the fish go up and gobble it into their mouths. And whatever they don't quickly swallow actually comes out their gills and flows down into the tank. And that's why you saw the hippo getting some food, despite the fact that she could not get anywhere near the auto feeder because of all those tentacles in her way. In my main tank, all the fish go right up to the auto feeder and they get their food with no problem at all, but she has to be more careful because of all those tentacles. But no, the food doesn't go down the overflow box. That's what I love about the chimney. It keeps the food in the tank where it belongs and that way everyone can eat it and none of it gets wasted. All right. Um... Rainer asks the questions, what is the best shape for an aquarium? And that really is going to come down to personal preference. But I can tell you that for myself, I really enjoy tanks that are rectangular or square rather than things that are rounded because I don't like the way the glass uh, refracts when you're looking at livestock in a curved environment. Like a reef vase or a reef bowl, for example, or a tank that's got that weird wave, the, the tanks with rounded corners, those types of environments, they just kind of change the look of the livestock for me and it kind of bugs me. So I, I prefer nice, simple, straight, clean lines myself. But it really comes down to also the livestock you're keeping. For example, if you're keeping sharks, you need it to be an oval. If you're keeping jellyfish, you need it to be round. So it really comes down to what you're putting in there. Mike asked the question, do you think you'll ever get the calcium reactor video out someday? Yes, I will. I promise I will. It's, uh, it's on my list. <laughs> um, Ashy says, any update of the Trident release date? The Trident release date has not been announced, but I can tell you this. We have been working on using it. There's, I don't know, 20, 30 people testing it. And they're all trying it out, and they're reporting to the group, including myself, our results of how it's working in our tanks, how it works with calibration, what kind of maintenance you're going to need, how often and how do you change the reagents in it. Uh, there's all that going on right now. So right now, uh, it's, it's too soon to say it's on its way, but mine is running around the clock. Uh, it comes on four times a day, and it, re it reports the results straight to Apex Fusion to where I can see the latest numbers. And like last night, I went ahead and pulled out my test kits and I was comparing some of my results to what the Trident has given me because I want to know. <coughs> but when, I don't know when it's going to be. <clears throat> Let's see. Martin asks, have you ever heard about ick getting into a system by adding a cleanup crew? I have heard it like one time. So... Let's say it's happened twice. <laughs> um, that's been posted about, which means maybe it's happened to 100 people out of 100,000 people. Uh, is it possible? Yes. Is it likely or could you expect it? It really shouldn't be the case. Typically, fish stores don't put the cleanup crew in the fish systems because the fish systems often in the stores are going to be lower salinity. 
And uh, the cleaner crew needs a higher salinity, so those usually are in their own tanks. And But, you know, when they're reaching in the tanks, just by reaching in with their hands or with their net or with their little plastic container they hang on the side of the tank, it could be transferred from one system to the next. There is a possibility of cross-contamination. So it is possible, but it's kind of unusual. I would think that what you could do, um, I mean, I'll tell you this. I have been buying cleanup crews for years. And I put them, I get them acclimated, I put them in my tank. I don't put them through coral dips, I don't put them through any kind of dips, I don't put them in quarantine, I just put them in my tanks. And I have seen ick occasionally, but I've never had an outbreak that was concerning or something where I had to deal with a big disaster. So I would hope the same results for you, but you know, obviously there's always going to be that one case where something bad happened to one person. But it's not very common. Oh, this is a good one. Olivier asks, any thoughts on Sally Lightfoot crabs? Are they reef safe or not? I just added three in a 525 liter system. I'm a little bit worried now. You know, the same thing happened to me. I got myself a Sally Lightfoot because I thought it was a really cool looking crab. And then, of course, I got online and I wanted to see what people thought. <laughs> and it was like a 50-50 thing. 50% said totally fine and 50% said, oh my God, you should not have put that in your reef. I didn't have a bad experience. I have seen them in reef tanks in the past. I don't know what kind of havoc they could cause. Personally, I didn't run into any issues, but they're very fast moving crabs. And I guess in that case, they may have the ability to catch fish or catch fish that are sleeping. So I guess keep doing your homework. The answer is I don't know for a fact that they're not reef safe. Um, I, like I said, people like to get them. And uh, they are interesting. I don't. I wouldn't say that they're helpful to the cleanup crew. I think they're more interesting to look at and enjoyable as a pet. But uh, maybe. Uh, well, let's put it this way. I haven't bought one in a long time. <laughs> so there's your answer. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to jump to, I, I want to answer, I want to talk about this for a second. Ever heard of problems with cat litter boxes and the ammonia gas that rises? And I'm dealing with that now. Well, it sounds to me like you need to clean your litter box a little bit more frequently so that you don't have any kind of ammonia smell at all. all right, there are litter boxes with like covers that have like a carbon filter on them. That might be another option. They have the automated uh uh, litter boxes that clean themselves and pull the stuff out automatically that might be an option but uh, have I heard about it affecting tanks not I have not heard that one so I'm just gonna say start cleaning it out and then someone asked me Jerry said how are your random flow generators working for you on your main tank they're working great they're looking a little bit cruddy right now because of the no pox and I kinda wanna pull them out and clean them or at least run a brush through them but I haven't done that yet but yeah I'm getting constant good flow and I'm very pleased with them so far. And I like that they're a smaller footprint. Let's see. Uh... <laughs> so Matt says, how many times have you bought a coral because it looked so awesome at the frag swap or at a store and you put it in your tank only to discover that you already had it? it just took it looked differently under their lights. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. And there has been the occasional time where I have rebought something I already had. Not very often, but occasionally I'll like, I already had that? Are you kidding me? It happens. I think we get caught up. We get excited. And I'll tell you, not just with tanks, because I was at Comic-Con and I bought the same comic book twice. <laughs> I came home with it like, yes! And I looked at my shelves like, oh, I had it already. So I gave it to someone else. Let's see. Oh my goodness, Tidal Gardens popped in here. I guess his live stream is done. Actually, I saw quite a few YouTubers in here. I love it. <laughs> and just like his show. What's up, guys? <laughs> Let's see. What is the formula you use for Phosphate RX? <clears throat> it's right on the package. It's on my website. 
It's six drops per 10 gallons of water to drop your phosphates 0.5 ppm. And that's what you want to do. You want to drop it 0.5 at a time. You're not trying to bring it down super rapidly. I mean, that's pretty fast already. But uh, you're, you're not trying to bring it from 3.0 to 0 overnight is my point. You want to bring it down gradually. Six drops per 10 gallons. If you don't have that high a phosphate, if your phosphate's only 0.25, you only need three drops per 10 gallons. And you can always err on the side of caution and use less than what is recommended and dose it a couple of times rather than doing one hard dose at once. So you can keep that in mind. But I have used Phosphate Rx for over 10 years and it is the only thing I use to control my phosphates. And I was gonna say that, so last night I tested my nitrates because I was hoping for a miracle, right? I was hoping the nitrates had come down. And my test kit only measures from zero to 25. <laughs> so it's a very small margin where I know that my phosphates have been 50, 60, 80 or more. So wanting it to come down to under 25 would be my first step, right? And last night I tested and of course I still couldn't tell. It's still hotter than 25. If you look at the, the scale, it goes up to clear all the way up to hot pink and mine is like fuchsia. So <laughs> it's pretty bad. And I diluted it this time by using twice as much salt water as the test asked for, hoping to see something. And it seems less bright, so I think it's working. I feel like I'm two weeks away from the big change. And then I thought, well, let me check phosphates because no pox also removes phosphate. And I wanted to see if phosphate had come down, if it had affected my phosphate. Typically, mathematically, it's supposed to do nitrate first and then phosphate second. That's how it's supposed to work. But when I dosed uh, vodka a few months ago, I was dosing it really aggressively trying to knock down nitrate in a hurry because I was being stubborn. And my phosphates were collapsing and I was, a couple of my corals were turning white because of it. And I was amazed it skipped the nitrate entirely and went straight for the phosphate. So I was wanting to make sure my nopox wasn't doing the exact same thing. And it did not. It's, uh, my phosphates are 0.5 where they belong. I'm good on that one. So yeah, I've got nitrates and phosphates in my tank. And no cyano and no horrible dinoflagellates. Anyone have a mandarin without copepods? I know the spelling isn't right on that. <laughs> No, actually, uh, you're really close. You got an A in there, and it's supposed to be an E. Other than that, it was right. Mandarins like to eat copepods. That is their main diet. And if you read threads online, you will constantly see people say they eat two to 3,000 a day. I don't know who came up with that number. I don't know who has two to 3,000 copepods in their tank every single day. But if you're lucky, you can train your mandarin fish to eat frozen foods or dry foods that you add to the tank. And that would be your goal. There is a video on this channel that I filmed a very long time ago that I found on my hard drive from 2005, I believe, where I had trained my mandarins to eat pellet food, and so that video shows it. And I used a very small jar, an olive jar, and I put the pellets in there and I lowered the jar into the tank so it was laying on the sand bed. And then the mandarin can swim in and get some pellets and swim back out. And the reason for that is because all the other fish would steal the food, and the mandarin's a slow-moving fish. It would miss out on the meals. And so this was my technique of providing food for the mandarin that worked. And nowadays we have so many different foods on the market. There are different products you can add to your tank to increase your pod population. One of the things that um, I've been talking to you guys about is Live Rock Enhance, and that cleans the tank. Well, they also have something called Reef Enhance, and I was told that that will increase your pod population. They'll just blow up. If you wanna see thousands of bugs in your tank, use Reef Enhance. Well, I have thrown too many things in my tank recently at the same time, and it was causing a little bit of chaos with the corals, and so I stopped. I'm not gonna add any reef enhance right now, but I did get some in, and if it works out, then that will also go on my website, because I'm sure some of you are gonna want it. But I, I don't wanna sell it until I've used it myself, and I've put it in my tank twice, but that was it. Uh, I need to kinda see, I wanna see the magic. And if I see a lot of bugs appearing on, on the glass of my tank, then I will say, yep, it definitely works, and I'll tell you guys about it, and then it'll be on my website, and you can get a jar if you want to get some too. And if you've got to have it now, let me know, but it's not on the website. Trunda asks, what's your take on transparent versus black silicone? Um, black silicone is actually very specific, and if it is not the right one, the tank may leak, unfortunately. So you want to make sure you're, you're getting a tank built by someone with a reliable... Uh, someone that is got a good reputation for building tanks 
because just because you ask for black silicone and four, four panes of glass does not mean it's going to hold water. And unfortunately, there was a bad run of black silicone a few years ago, I remember, and there was a lot of tanks were failing. So using the tried and true silicone is probably more of a successful storyline, but my reef here, that's using black silicone. And uh, this tank's running five and a half years. Uh, it's, uh, it just has to be the right one. And you need to know the reputation of the tank builder. That would be my, my recommendation. Because that way you can find out, like talk to some of their customers, uh, kind of check on their history, kind of check on how many they had to rebuild. That might help you figure out some answers. Tyler has a chemistry question for the class. <laughs> my tank is testing at 490 calcium, which is a little high. Uh, my alkalinity is 7.5 and 1500 for magnesium. Can I dose all to raise the level or do I need to do two part? I don't have a heavy stock of SPS, just coralline growing. Well, to be honest, you should stop dosing magnesium and you should stop dosing calcium right now. And I would just add a little bit of alkalinity to bring that number up a little bit higher. That sounds a little bit low. And if you are somewhere between 8 and 11, like 8.5, and stay there and stick there, your tank will do really well. Your magnesium is too high at 1,500. You're going to want to be somewhere between 13 and 1,400, and you're going to want your calcium to be at most 450. So what you can do, since you don't have much livestock in there right now, and it's just kind of, you know, growing coralline, wait a week on definitely magnesium and calcium and just dose alkalinity and see where your numbers land in a week. I think your alkalinity will come up slightly and hopefully in about two weeks or three weeks the calcium and the magnesium will start to come down a little bit to where they belong. Are sexy shrimp reef safe? Absolutely. They're beautiful. They're adorable. They're microscopic. They do great in tiny tanks because if I put one of those guys in my 400 gallon I would never see it again. Keep in mind there are certain fish that eat shrimp so if you're a wrasse lover then you may not see them very long because they might become a uh, expensive snack. But if you don't have any wrasses in your tank, odds are it'll be okay. Sexy shrimp do like to congregate near anemones. Uh, that's a good spot for them. They, that's really the spot I see them most. They could be near rock anemones, flower anemones, uh, maxi minis, uh, carpet anemones, uh, bubble tips. They really like anemones. So I would expect to find them around that, but they could be found in other parts of the tank, like on the rock work. Yeah, definitely reef safe and super adorable. All right. Oh, it seems like everyone's running a stream today. <laughs> Even Tyler Garden says, everyone is streaming today. Let's see. Moshe says that every time I throw a frozen cube into my tank, my skimmer goes nuts. Uh, what brand of frozen food are you using? Because if it's like P.E. Mysis, that is a very oil-based frozen food, and that will affect the protein skimmer. Typically, though, it makes the skimmer collapse rather than overflow. So first step I would do is when you feed your tank, I would turn off the skimmer anyway, because why skim out what you're trying to add to the tank? And then have the skimmer start up 30 minutes later. And uh, hopefully it should, it should adjust well uh, to that situation. Let your livestock kind of absorb the food before you get the skimmer going again. Robert says, will there be a future video on no pox? Absolutely. I kind of was playing with the thought of doing a video now and releasing where I'm at, but I kind of want the video to be why I did it, how it went, and the conclusion. That seems to be a more logical video for my type of channel rather than one that's part A and then later on we do a part B and hopefully it's a good part B. <laughs> I'd rather have a good review than a, a halfway and then a decide, oh, do I really want to say this? Um, this one here I don't know the answer to, but I'll read the question. Is there any connection between dinoflagellates, algae, versus dinoflagellates, parasites, velvet? I have no idea. None of that makes any sense to me. Dinoflagellates, as far as I know, are a horrible bacteria. Um but I have not heard it called those things. Then again, I am not a uh, marine biologist with a microscope either. Sorry.
Gregory asks, uh, or he says, I have a blue throat trigger, uh, and I'd like to get a cleaner shrimp for the benefit of my other fish. Do you think this is a good idea? Well, I don't think that trigger is going to have a problem with your cleaner shrimp. Whether the cleaner shrimp benefits your fish or not is what I'm debating, because sometimes cleaner shrimp are just pretty, and they're just a part of your tank, but to see them actually picking a fish clean doesn't seem to happen as much in reef aquariums. I mean, yeah, it does happen on occasion. You might see a uh, shrimp hop on a fish and pick it clean. You may not. You might see the same thing with a coral banded shrimp. Uh, they are also a fish cleaner in our, in our tanks. But will it benefit your fish necessarily? I think it's more fun just to have. Mike is back in my Phosphate RX topic versus GFO, pros and cons. Phosphate RX is easy. You just do it once in a blue moon. GFO sucks. That's why I don't do it. <laughs> How is that for an answer? <laughs> I can't wait to read the replies later. <laughs> uh, let's see. Tattooed Dancer. Now I need to see pictures. Um, <laughs> says, what's your favorite soft coral? I'd say the toadstool leather. That is my favorite. You can grow it from a tiny little piece into something beautiful and amazing, and it's a very highly enjoyable coral. You're not going to see any in this tank here, but I just thought I'd give you a change of pace. You've been looking at me too long. So, in this tank there are no soft corals. It's all uh, LPS or SPS or anemones. The, oh, there's a recordia down here in the very bottom back, but you can't get to it. So, it's soft. But anyway, I have a toadstool leather that's growing in the back of my reef right now that's really pretty. Matter of fact, why don't I try and point you guys at the other tank for a few minutes. That doesn't look half bad. I'll lift it up a little low. This spot right here that's all dead, right there, because I had a whole bunch of fungias and they stung the heck out of this beautiful chalice. So that was a bummer. Let's lift this up. And right back there, all right here, that's my toadstool leather right now. And that toadstool is a green polyp toadstool, so it's actually really pretty, especially under blue lighting. Let's see if I move you a little bit closer to the tank. And we're going to turn this slightly. Maybe we can tilt this up a little bit more. How's that? All right. We'll leave that on there for a couple of minutes while I'm answering more questions. Catherine says she watched a Mandarin uh, Dragonette video and tried it, and it worked. And hers are eating Formula 2 pellets. Isn't that interesting? Because Formula 2 is the vegetarian diet, where Formula 1 is the omnivore diet. And yet, you're right. Mandarins will eat either or both. Uh, let's see. Wow. This is an old school question here. What is your opinion on using a fluidized sand bed filter on a reef tank? Um, those were used in the past for, uh, they were like in a reactor, and it would be a really tall reactor, like, you know, 8 feet tall, 10 feet tall, tumbling the sand. Very few people are using those with uh, reef tanks these days. I've really only seen it happen with um, like big aquaculture facilities where they keep the power going nonstop. And one of the downsides of a fluidized sand bed reactor is that if the power goes out, all the bacteria in there can collapse and die. So that one there, that I don't even know where you'd be able to find one of those these days. I'm sure it's available, but it's a long time ago. <laughs> Steve Smith says, any thoughts on sand fleas from the beach? I'm going to stop right there and say no. I don't think about those at all. <laughs> that sounds horrible. And I know you're asking if you can put it in your tank. And I would say no. Because I don't know what they are. I have a 20-gallon nano that is, is it big enough for a tuxedo urchin? Yes, you could definitely put a tuxedo urchin in a 20-gallon. And you might need to feed that urchin some food from time to time, depending on your algae load. If your algae is relatively uh, thinned out, you know, your tank's really clean, you might want to just put some nori on a clip, and the urchin will probably come over and eat it right off the clip, you know, whatever that the fish didn't get first. Uh, 
Uh, Tyler, I see your response to my questions about magnesium, calcium, and alkalinity. Anyway, um, whether you're not dosing anything at all, I would, you might have to change salt brands if those numbers stay that high all the time. Or double check that your numbers are even true. It could be that you need to have that retested and verify those numbers because they may not be accurate. I'm seeing too many lights on the screen here. I want to see if I can fix this a little bit better. Let's do that. It's a little nicer. By the way, I've got over here three um, antheus. And if you look, you'll notice there's one that's in the foreground, really pretty. And then I've got these two right here. This is the male, and these are the females. When I bought them, I had three females, and this one turned into a male and it's getting more and more of that rich purple color. It's not there yet. It's still got a lot of orange in it. But the girls, by comparison, are vivid orange with their beautiful purple eye, eye uh, I don't know, eye makeup. <laughs> and uh, the male, is they're hanging out in a group, and I love it. I really would like to add more antheas. I think that would be a lot of fun. All right. You guys are so chatty today. I don't even know where I left off. Let me see. Drew asks, do you leave the flow on when you feed or do you stop the flow temporarily to feed? I turn off the return pump so my food stays inside the tank itself. But I have all the vortex moving the food all over the tank and the fish chase it every direction until it's gone. Tattoo Dancer gives a suggestion that Tidal Gardens and Milos Reef should get together and do a collaboration. And I would love to fly out there and see his facilities and uh, just film something fun. I think that would be a great idea. Uh, here's an interesting question. Have you ever clipped the top of an SPS to see if it would start doing something? Uh, a couple of his were sitting stagnant for a while. And, you know, you can wait for months with nothing happening at all. You know, just literally just sitting there doing nothing. Won't live, won't die. Just kind of sits there hibernating. You can trim them or relocate them to a new spot, and that might spur some, some growth or some change. That is a possibility. But... Uh, you know, I did that recently. I had a coral I got from uh, a friend a year and a half ago, and it did absolutely nothing. So it was recently placed in the back of my reef in a new spot with different flow, and we'll see if it does anything at all. I have no idea what's going on with it. Someone asked, what's the topic today? Gold slinger? And I got to tell you, we already did it. <laughs> now we're just doing the Q&A. <clears throat> so you have to play back the beginning later to hear what we talked about. Oh, here's an interesting question. What is the minimal tank size for a clam? That is really interesting because you don't often hear that question at all. So clams are come in different sizes. And it would I guess we could start off with what size clam are you buying in the first place? If you're getting one inch clams, you could probably have a couple in a nice all-in-one 20 or 29 gallon aquarium and do perfectly well for a couple of years. But if you're wanting something bigger, like a Durassa or a Crescia, uh, God forbid you want a Gigas, which are these ginormous super clams, those have to be in thousand gallon aquariums because they're so big and they absorb so much calcium and alkalinity, you gotta be able to support it and it would never last long in a small environment. Um, but yeah, so it comes down to the type of clam you want in the first place. And of course, will your system support that life because Though they are very demanding. They definitely are filter feeders. They need plenty of food. And while we have an abundance of foods we can use, they need good, adequate light. They need good, adequate flow. You know, you need to stay on top of your parameters and keep the tank very stable. But other than that, yeah, no, clams are awesome. Matter of fact, I, it's, I'm long overdue to get some clams in my tank again. Let's see. <laughs> uh, Dustin says, have you ever had any issues with the copper band eating corals or fighting with the tangs? No, matter of fact, the tangs don't even notice the copper band at all. I'm going to move this camera over again, give you another different view. And still see these darn lights. 
I don't like those lights sitting there on the ceiling. Let me see if we change this and bring this down a little bit lower. Give you a better view of Spock. Still getting those lights. I guess I can't help it. That's just the angle you get. But, or actually, you know what? Let's do it from the front. We have enough wire, I think. Okay, let's do this. And I could remove that filter. It's going to look a little blue to you guys. I think this is better, though, for now. Trying to find that sweet spot. Can't make up my mind which way I like this best. It's like photography. I care too much. How about like that? Okay. Let me get this thing off the screen. No, my tangs have had no interest at all in the copper band whatsoever. So I didn't worry about that. And the, um, the copper band was initially there for Aptasia and Mahano control. And now she's so spoiled, she's ignoring the Mahanos, and I have to go in there and kill the Mahanos myself. Um, Trent asks, should I stop dosing Nopox if my nitrates have never, ever got that high? And see if they'll rise any higher. Well, what, what are they right Oh, yeah, you're saying there are only three right now? You probably don't need to dose any at all, to be honest. Um, and you could see what your nitrates end up being after a few weeks without it. Um, I would say, I don't know how much you're using, but you probably want to taper off gradually, not just suddenly stop, and that way it, your tank can absorb or get used to not having no pox in the water. Um, and then Josh asks, what would happen if a hammer coral comes in contact with a nephthia, which is a leather coral? Um, odds are the hammer may get stung. The nephthia itself won't be harmed by the hammer coral. If it was a torch coral, the torch would win for sure. But I think the hammer coral would get hit by the nephthia uh, in a little bit of chemical warfare. I would definitely separate them. Um, are you still using the abyss pump and at what percent? I believe right now my abyss pump is running around uh, 83%. <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's pretty much set it and forget it. It just runs. And Eddie asks, is $100 for a neon-tip neon torch a good deal? It sounds like it because a lot of these corals are not accessible anymore. So what's left on the market, the price is just going to go higher and higher. Um, it depends on, do you like the color, the size of it, how many polyps there are? You know, is it just one polyp or is it, I mean, one head or is it multiple heads? Uh, you'll have to shop around on that one, but 100 doesn't sound horrible to me. It might be a little bit high compared to the old days, but, you know, things have changed now that certain corals can't be exported anymore. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> ben says, I'm growing green, dense algae in the display, but I'm also getting coral growth. If I only feed a small amount of frozen food a day for three fish, um... In a 150-gallon tank with a skimmer, a refugium, GFO. What am I missing? Why are you growing? Well, you haven't mentioned your cleanup crew. So you probably need to lower your phosphates because I'm going to assume that you have some phosphates in there. You can literally blow off the rock work with a power head. You can take a MaxiJet or a Nero 5 or whatever it is you own for flow and point it at all the rock work and kick up all the detritus and get all that out of the system which can be caught through water changes, filter socks, protein skimmer, and reduce the actual waste that's in your rock work, that will help weaken the algae. And then lowering the phosphates will weaken them further, and then you should be able to start ripping it out, and a cleanup crew will eat what's left. Okay. Um... <clears throat> Antonio asks, would it be possible to see the flow of the, the uh, vortex turned off? They're out of reach right now at the moment. Um, and I don't think you're going to see a lot of action in my tank when the vortex are off because the VCAs are pointing straight at those SPS corals, and SPS corals don't show any action. So it would be kind of boring.
Yeah, Trent, I would wean your system off the no-pox. <clears throat> Just do it gradually. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure why you're dealing with a bacterial bloom from removing no-pox. No-pox is dosing bacteria, and now you're taking it away. It should just fade away on its own. I don't think you have to add more bacteria at this point. <clears throat> uh, Kevin, you're kind of talking to a newbie when it comes to no-pox. I'm actually trying it out myself. This is my third week of using it. Technically, your nitrates should come down first, and then your phosphates would come down second. So the fact that your phosphates are coming down um, now and nitrates aren't budging at all is a little surprising to me. If anything, you could feed a little bit more heavily so your phosphates don't drop out and, you know, drop out and bottom out. All right, there. Well, guys, it has been too long. We have been talking too long. An hour and 45 minutes. Why don't we wrap this thing up? Um, I appreciate that you guys tuned in today and asked all your questions and that you listened to me ramble a little bit about pristine new tanks and, and the frustrations that happen with new tanks. Your tanks are here to give you enjoyment, and, you know, we, we joke that having an aquarium is going to be very relaxing, and yet all we do is stress about every little thing. <laughs> so I want to wrap this up with the thought that I don't want you to be stressed. I want you to enjoy your tank. I want you to sit back. I want you to look at the positives. I want you to figure out and isolate the negatives, how you can correct them. I want you to come up with a game plan of how you want to address the problem you're trying to solve, so you can do it in a relaxing way and not be angry, not be upset, not be uh, full of anger and hate. Because that is the opposite of what these animals need. We care about them and we want them to be beautiful and we want them to grow and thrive. And so our attitude also is part of the whole picture. So being positive is really important and, uh, and being proactive is important. I'm in the process now where I need to clean out my sump because all the weird stuff happening down there from the no-pox, I got to clean it all out. I'm not looking forward to it, but it's just part of what I got to do to keep improving the health of my aquarium and keep the livestock thriving because that's really what I care about. And I want you guys to be the same way. Today is water test Saturday. Be sure that you are testing your water. We want to know all your parameters. And so if you don't have current up-to-date test kits, it might be time to buy some new ones. As reef keepers, we test alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, salinity, temperature, pH, phosphate, nitrate, um, and if you have a controller, you can also track your ORP. Uh, if you happen to be one of the very few that have a trident, make sure your reagents aren't low. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, at some point, we are going to have to worry about those kind of things as more and more people get that gizmo. But, uh, you know, you might have an alkatronic or something like that, and it uses reagents. You want to make sure they're filled up. Make sure your waste collector is emptied out, you know, those kind of things. Uh, I also always recommend on Saturday to clean out your skimmer. We recently had storms blow through. Did you remember to clean out your skimmer before the storm hit? Did you know that barometric pressure affects your skimmer and can make it overflow and all the stuff sitting in the cup will just bubble over and go right back into your system because you didn't clean it out because you were lazy? So make sure you clean out your skimmer. That means take off the cup, clean out the inside of it, clean the cup area itself, and then clean the neck of the skimmer so it's nice and clear again. That should not be gunked up. And if you want, you can use something as simple as an all-plastic toilet brush or glass cleaning brush. This right here works in all my skimmers. It works in the collection cup, it works inside the neck, and it works down inside both NIO skimmers. So I recommend that as an easy way to clean things. And if you are staying on top of your system, your livestock should thrive. And I want to thank you guys for tuning in today. We have another live stream happening next week. And this week, I am going to see about cranking out some videos because I want to get some things off my hard drive. So I hope you guys have a great weekend and happy reefing.